I invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 3. We've been working through 1 Peter, and we come to verse 18 today. And I will be reading um, through chapter 4, verse 11. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, this is your word. It is true. It stands firm forever. And we change. We, we are fickle and changing, vacillating. But Lord, you stay the same. And your word stands forever. And we are grateful for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would send your spirit now as we read and listen to this word uh, to give us an ability to hear it clearly. And Lord, be with me and forgive me for my sins and my failings and send your spirit upon me that I might declare your word faithfully. And Lord, let all of your people bring glory and honor to your name. Let us reflect your glory in what we think and believe as well as how we live, what we do and what we say. And Lord, thank you for giving us this moment to sit together under your word and we wait with expectation to see what you will do in this time we have. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. First Peter chapter 3, beginning in verse 18. Hear the word of God. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made, made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Since, therefore, Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. For whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. But they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is why the gospel was preached even to those who are dead, that though judged in the flesh the way people are, they might live in the spirit the way God does. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Some of you may have heard or even remember a 
street preachers who made the way across college campuses many years ago by the name of Brother Max. Uh, Brother Max uh, would come to Purdue usually on Fridays and he would draw a crowd out on the uh, uh, memorial field uh, on nice weather lots of people would be out there sitting talking throwing frisbees doing other things and uh, brother Max would come around lunchtime and he would he would preach hellfire and brimstone and uh, there was there was gospel in there there was a, a a warning to flee to Christ, who is our salvation. Um, and there was scripture in what he said, uh, uh, but there was, a, there was a lot of fire. There was a lot of anger. And it was fascinating to see the reactions of people around Brother Max. Certainly not said with gentleness and respect, and a lot of people made fun of them. There were a lot of hecklers in the crowd. Uh, but there was a certain kind of attraction there. I mean, people came, maybe they came to heckle, maybe they came and wondered, wond and walked away thinking again about other things, um, but they did listen. He was very much uh, the way I sometimes imagine John the Baptist to have been. Just not a very likable person. Uh, and and speaking speaking a word, I, I won't say he was. I won't say he was a false preacher. He was just really really rough, really hard. And I think of other examples of uh, holiness or godliness that I've thought about through the years. Uh, and uh, I. Uh, one name that came briefly to my mind this morning was uh, Judge uh, John Hughes, that many of you remember. Um, I just love John and his faith. And I thought about him this morning for a reason. I, I'll tell you why in a moment. But uh, John, John wore a hat like this, short-brimmed short black hat. And... Uh, I wanted to be like John, so I went out and bought a black hat like this, short brim black hat. Um, some people call it my rabbi hat, is a, a, my black when I'm wearing black. Um, but I thought about John, but uh, I thought about John and this hat uh, as I was thinking about another person, and that's Harry Stackhouse. And I want to talk to you a little bit about Harry Stackhouse as I begin my uh, sermon today. Um, and, and the connection with the hat is, I, I've only known Harry for a few years, but Harry's been a fixture in Waukegan. He was a co-owner of Stern's clothing store for many years before he was called into the ministry. And Stern's is where I went to get this hat. Um, so I might, have, I might have met him back then, back then in the, in the 90s. Um, but Harry was called into the ministry and started Sign of the Dove Church down on 10th Street. Uh, and Harry, uh, uh, Harry, uh, that, that's, a, that's a different tradition down there. They're, they're worship in a different way. There is, theology is different from mine on several points. It's Pentecostal, not Pentecostal. Um, and yet, uh, Pastor Harry had a deep love for the Lord and for people. And uh, Harry was um, one of the Mosaic leadership team. Actually, it was Harry that started talking with Trinity Seminary years ago about how to bridge this divide between the seminary and, and the community, and especially Waukegan and Trinity, how, how can we relate together? And it was out of that that this mosaic initiative that we've been a part of has grown. And Harry was one of the key leaders, in, mosaic leaders, in drawing these, these 12 
churches together in this partnership, in this, in this study that, that we've been a part of. Last, uh, Harry died a little over a week ago, about 75, I think. And uh, last Thursday, most of us Mosaic pastors got together. And we, uh, we prayed together, and we all shared our stories of gratitude for Harry and his life. And uh, Harry was very much a pastor to pastors, and uh, I, I was blessed by him. Um, and I want you to know that Harry was a huge cheerleader of First Presbyterian Church. Not only in speaking to me or to some of our Mosaic people, but speaking to people everywhere, throughout the Mosaic churches, down at Trinity. Uh, Harry really believed in me and this church. And uh, that was enormously encouraging to me. Sometimes when I had found it hard to believe in myself, Harry was believing in me. And when I thought, man, I don't know what this church could do, Harry was believing in First Presbyterian Church. He was so excited about us and our ministry. He knew um, our desire to be used by the Lord, and he respected that, honored that. He knew of all the 12 churches in the Mosaic Initiative. He knew that our church probably had the greatest challenges and the furthest to overcome. And he was always cheering for us. After I shared with the other pastors, one of the other mosaic leaders of the, the whole team set, reminded me, he said, you know, whenever we get together as a ministry team, uh, Pastor Harry would so often talk about First Pres and how grateful to God he was for what we were doing at First Pres. Harry uh, was very different from Brother Max, a, a man of godliness and holiness. And I think about our lives and how we live. What do people see in us? Uh, we want to be good witnesses for Jesus. How do we do that? Uh, the book of 1 Peter talks about how we are elect exiles. We are a holy nation. We are a royal priesthood. We are a chosen people to declare, to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Our message, our proclamation is of utmost importance. But our conduct and our manner is a part of that witness, isn't it? Uh, people may listen to what we say. They are certainly watching how we live. And God says at the beginning of, of, uh, of 1 Peter, the Bible says, Be holy, for I am holy. In chapter 1, uh, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But he who has called you, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Now that's quite a task. That's quite a job description. Be holy as I am holy, God says. And, but holy means to be consecrated, to be set aside for God's purposes. We are exiles in the world. We, we are in the world, but, but we don't fully belong here. We belong to God and his kingdom. Um, so we are consecrated. We are set apart from the world for service to God. Uh, holiness is consecration, but holiness is also obedience. It's, it's righteous living. It's not perfection. We do not achieve that here until he takes us home. But we are growing in the likeness of Christ. That's holiness. 
And the first part uh, that I read for you, the end of chapter 3, God is describing the holiness of Christ and how it led Jesus to suffer for us. Christ suffered for a holy purpose. He, He suffered to atone for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring us to God. And then there are some things here, um, and we'll, we'll talk about them uh, uh, on Wednesday night. Some pretty deep theology here about uh, proclaiming how, how uh, Christ proclaimed to the spirits who were in prison, and, and that's a, a bit complicated. But the main thing here is an illustration of proclaiming this message and how some people were rejected, even as they did in Noah's days. And a a, a few people, Noah and his family, were saved through the ark by hearing the promise of God and believing in it. And that we too now are saved by the message of Christ and putting our faith in him and we are rescued and delivered. That's the main point of that illustration, but it comes because of God's sacrificial self-sacrifice. Oh, that's a bad sentence. Uh, edit that out, Kim, when you do the, uh, do the video. Uh, his, his self-sacrifice for our behalf. Be holy. Then he goes on in chapter 4. Be holy. There's a lot of theology here, but he's making a practical point. Be holy. And that's not easy. Because holiness requires suffering. And we see some examples of the suffering to which we are called in our pursuit of holiness. There's the suffering of self-denial. What do we see here in in, uh, 1 Peter 4, verse 3? For the time that is for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. Holiness calls us to deny ourselves by giving up past sins. Now, why do we do these things? Why do we sin? We sin because we enjoy it. We sin because we want to sin. Oh, oh yes, we've, we've, we have nobler purposes in mind. We have, we have other desires. But in the moment that we sin, the desire that overtakes them all is our desire for this thing. And so that's what we do. And holiness is causing us to, to, to have always be pushing those things behind us and reminding us that those belong to the past. God has called us to something new. We will slip up, we will mess up, but we need to say, no, God has made me new, that belongs to the old. Sensuality, drunkenness, lawless idolatry, and the like. That's for those who don't know God. But I belong to God. I belong to the Lord now, and so I will do, as Jesus said, deny myself, take up my cross, and follow him. So we have a lot to give up, sins. We may also find ourselves giving up even good things. The the passage, starting in paragraph in verse 7, talks about some of the things that we'll give up. He, He says, for example, how we've each received gifts. What do we do with what God has given to us? Will we use them to serve others and not ourselves? That also is a form of self denial, not just using our gifts on ourselves, but using them in the service of others. And he'll call us as another practical app. Uh, illustration here, to hospitality. Verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. And I'm going to say that hospitality is a kind of self-denial. I don't know if you feel it that way. Some people are just naturally hospitable, but, uh, but the Bible here is talking to all of us because when we show hospitality, we are giving up some of our space and some of our time for others. Uh, and, and that takes some 
effort um, because sometimes we just want to be left alone or do our own thing. We regard our time as our time, our space as our space, but hospitality says, no, we use it to serve others, at least a part. And, you know, I was, uh, I was convicted of this. I, th I, I mentioned, I, I preached a good bit uh, more than a year ago on hospitality. I do think that that is a key way for us to be engaged in reaching other people outside of our congregation. Uh, but we didn't get very far, and, and partly we can blame that on COVID. I mean, <laughs> what's hospitality look like for the past year, right? It's been a mess. We, we don't let anybody into our, our, our bubbles, um, and, and that makes this hard. But we're not going to be here forever. And when we come back, I really hope we can continue to encourage one another and stretch ourselves when it comes to hospitality. That's going to be hard. That'll be hard for me. That'll be hard for you. But I think we can, we can encourage one another in, in that. Holiness is a call to self-denial, even of some good things like that. Uh, and holiness may also call us to a kind of suffering that comes from ridicule. See this in verse 4 of chapter 4. With respect to this, our putting things in the past and not doing certain sins, with respect to that, with respect to this, they are surprised, meaning the Gentiles, which mean godless people, people who are not walking with the Lord or know the Lord. Uh, with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they malign you. Do you ever feel like that? Are people kind of surprised, maybe, if they're all doing something or all about something, and you don't go along with the flow? And people think, oh, you know, what's wrong with you? Or what a killjoy you are. And uh, 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 people just don't get it. Uh, Karen Jobes in her commentary says this she says Peter encourages his readers to continue to abstain from the things that society deems acceptable even though by their abstinence they condemn such conduct and thereby possibly incur the anger of those who indulge in such things there are certain currents in the world, certain things that people around us will do, family, peers, friends, and we just believe that God has called us to something different and we want to stand up. And uh, even if we don't speak out against it, it, simply by refusing to participate is its own kind of witness. And that's what holiness calls us to. And it may mean that some people don't get it and some people are maligned. I wonder, are some people surprised at the way we live? Uh, and if they're not, why is that the case? Do we try to blend in and be accepted? Or do we reflect the values of the kingdom of God, even when they stand out? And we can talk about things uh, like a certain uh, uh, modesty of dress, careful speech, refusing to take part in the gospel fest that's going on, or uh, crude joking, or, uh, or a kind of a demeaning name calling. Um, when we don't participate in that, we're making a statement. It's tricky though, isn't it? This is tricky. Um, because, brothers and sisters, we could fake all that. We could fake holiness. Um, we can clean up our act on the outside, but be completely different in private or when we're with certain crowds. We can just adapt to whatever's around us so that we are part. And when we want to be in the the church part, the God part, then we can put on that mask as well. And with practice, we can get pretty darn good at it. We can fool a lot of people. We can't fool God, but we fool a lot of people. 
So we want to be about a pursuit of happiness, uh, of holiness, but without being fake and without resorting to a kind of uh, joyless finger wagging and legalism. Um, so this is tricky. There's a tricky balance for us. Some people will look at us and they might notice that we're different and they're going to wonder, is this real or is this an act? If it's real, why do you act that way? Is there something that I might need to see here or learn here? And I, I've called this in the sermon title, I've called this the strange attraction of holiness. We're attracted to people with convictions, who live by noble principles, who will speak the truth with love, who will uh, live out what they say. It's a strange attraction because so often we find it puzzling. We don't really quite get it. It makes us suspicious and, and curious. Uh, sometimes it can be repulsive. Uh, like uh, you know, people wanting to get too close enough to kind of see what's going on, but not any closer because they don't really want to be sucked into something that they're not ready for. That's that strange attraction. We might push holiness away. We might malign it. It's too uncomfortable. And yet there is something about that integrity and that conviction that we find winsome. And people, people responded to Jesus in just that way, didn't they? They responded to Jesus in all those kind of ways, too. They found him strangely attractive. Some people could embrace him. He grew, drew crowds. But he also had his share of hecklers and those who would seek to do away with him. And there were those who would listen and like the teaching, and the stories were really great. Uh, but when it came to taking up a cross and denying themselves and following him, they would walk away. Jesus asked some who stayed with him, are you going to go too? And they'd say, Lord, where can we go? You have the words of eternal life. This kind of strange attraction, I think, is built into the warp and the woof of the gospel itself. Because we are saved by grace and through faith, and Jesus has paid for all of our sins. But he also calls us to repent and to believe and to walk in a manner that is pleasing to him. So, so we hold these things together. We, we put off the sinful ways to follow in the way of Christ, and, and we live in this tension. Jesus accepts us and, and cleanses us and removes us from our guilt, and there's, there's no condemnation. We stand secure in Christ, and at the same time, he is calling us to push our sins away, to repent of our sins, and to walk in his ways in the path of holiness. We've got those together. That is a strange attraction to the gospel for us. We need to take sin seriously because God does. And we need to so show love and grace because God does. We need to find a path to holiness that's not self-righteous. We need to be able to rejoice in the mercy of God that is beyond our deserving and to live no longer for human passions, but rather for the will of God. Each day that's something that we have to do. And I thought about this especially as a part of our witness uh, through this book that I've been reading, um, Elliot Clark's book on evangelism as exiles. And he, he says this about this, this passage. He says, holiness is not only the result of conversion, it's also an embodied argument in support of the gospel's veracity. We're saved to be holy, and we become holy so others will be saved. In other words, the gospel is intended to be lived out in us so that people 
will see that it is true and not only hear that it is true? How could we proclaim the gospel of the transforming power of God if our lives are not changed? Not perfectly, not perfectly, but perceptively. So let's take holiness seriously. God will be glorified and we will grow and maybe others will be intrigued. What makes you different? And even if they can't quite believe it, they see us living in a way that makes us wish they could and wish that it were true. Holiness is a part of our witness as elect exiles. We're reluctant to stand out But the more like Jesus we become, the more we will be different from the world. And we may repulse some, and some may be strangely attracted and draw near to see if they can figure it all out. I love that hymn we ban worship with. uh, May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day, by his love and power controlling all I do and say. May the love of Jesus fill me as the waters fill the sea, him exalting, self-abasing. This is victory. And may his beauty rest upon me as I seek the lost to win, and may they forget the channel, seeing only him. Oh, Lord our God, this is our prayer.